we all have our own constraints around how we dream about things and how we build things. But, you know, the real, the real gift is to, to believe that you're going to be successful in where you spend your time, you know, weed out things that aren't successful for you and, and, and find the things that you really want to spend your time on, of course, but also make sure that your vision's big because, you know, you only have so much time. All right, folks, super excited for this episode. I'm here today with the Mike Jones. Uh, Mike is a, uh, a tech OG, he's a legend in the space. Um, he first created the user plane in the 90s. I think it was in the 90s, he can confirm that. Sold it to AOL. Um, after that, he was the turnaround CEO of MySpace. Yes, the MySpace helped the company navigate, uh, I don't wanna say losing its legacy status, but I think did I don't know if that's the right way to describe it. Um, mm -hmm. But after MySpace, I uh, invested in a bunch of different brands. He now runs Science. Science is a venture firm. They're an incubator. They've got a SPAC. Uh, a lot of folks might know one of their portfolio companies, Dollar Shave Club. They were first money in and really helped build, actually, Dollar Shave Club. A um, whole bunch of different stuff. Before we jump into the episode, want to call out our Digital Asset Summit coming up in New York City, September 14th and 15th. If anyone is looking to come and price is an issue, head on over to our website, use code EMPIRE, you'll get a nice little discount code. And with that, Mike, let's jump in. How you doing, my friend? Good. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Feeling like yeah. a tech OG makes me just sound like I'm old, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Was that a no, fair way to true. describe uh, No, it's fair. My, it's my fair. Space. I think, yeah, MySpace was a, you know, a challenged asset when I started working at it. I think it was probably the most formative learning experience in my career, but you know, super difficult, um, incredible team, incredible journey. But, uh, you know, we were able to kind of sell it off in parts to basically recover some value for News Corp, but it's a super difficult turnaround. Yeah, totally. What, yeah. so, so fill me in. So what happened there? So, um, you like MySpace was, was quote unquote failing and like they brought you in or they just did this acquisition with new News Corp and they wanted like a more experienced CEO and they brought you in. What, how did this actually play out? Um, well, the way it kind of happened was, you know, I'd known MySpace for a really long period of time because um, my company, UserPlan, that you mentioned was actually a service provider uh, providing them live chat services and digital music streaming and such. And um, a friend of mine who had bought one of my businesses, John Miller, went to go work as, uh, as the head of digital for News Corp. And of which, you know, MySpace was under his, uh, you know, under his, you know, organization. And so... He saw that Facebook was catching up and about to exceed them as a, you know, in the kind of daily active user metric. Um, MySpace itself had expanded globally, but was, it was a very costly expansion and they really hadn't hit any level of profitability. And News Corp at that point wanted to change management and see if there was another strategy to pursue. Um, I came in with a group of other, other managers and then ended up, you know, rising to be the CEO. And we went through kind of three big phases. The first was, you know, reducing, you know, $100 million of budget cutting off a whole bunch of heads and, and de-staffing in a certain sense, and then trying to get the organization into a point where it could kind of function economically. The second was a massive tech rebuild, because at that point, MySpace was running all of its own tech infrastructure, you know, and a lot of technology had changed. And they had a really complicated system set up that was advanced first time, absolutely, but expensive and labor, labor intensive to run. So we went through a huge tech refactor. And then the third was a big relaunch. And we went through a massive relaunch campaign. And at the end of that, we really found that like, Consumers had an image of what MySpace was. At that point, the image was banner ads and fake profiles and music. And no matter how much time and money we spent throwing at that for marketing, we really weren't going to change that image. Like it really was like that was what it was. And, um, you know, I kind of came to News Corp and said, look, you know, no, no matter how much time and money you want to give me on this, I don't think I can take your mid American target consumer and make them think we're something different. You know, Facebook came out with something very different than us. Everyone's still connected to us. Everyone knows us, but the legacy is still there and it's really hard to repair. And I just didn't think it was worth their time to try to spend and fix it. It's funny. I, I, I'm, you have such a uh, different view of my, like my view of MySpace. I was in, I don't know, seventh grade or like, I don't know, freshman mm -hmm. year of high school or something using this thing. The biggest thing that I remember about MySpace is that you could customize the pages because some, it was like the first time, like, I feel like this was, I'm not sure if this was purposeful, but there was something in the code that made it so that you could change the HTML and the CSS. That's what I remember. Yeah. I also remember stressing about the top eight friends on MySpace mm -hmm. and moving the friends around. Like if you actually look at it from a business and strategic perspective, Facebook coming around, I it does feel like the Facebook and MySpace actually weren't that different, except that Facebook realized that you could just basically build MySpace 
but with real friends and plug into real networks instead of having a lot of like not yeah. fake people, but you know, like anonymous and like wonky people on there. Is that like a right view from an outsider's perspective? Yeah. I mean, so a few things there. One is, yeah, there's this old story that there was a developer named Gabe Harriman who became a really close friend of mine. And he notoriously was the guy that accidentally um, forgot to turn off HTML input into the comments box or whatever, or the form field inside of MySpace profile. And people started manipulating the profile layouts. And he told me the story that he went to the management and said, guys, I'm so sorry. I obviously really screwed up. We're not stripping HTML out of the comments. And they're like, no, 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 like leave it. It's a, it's a feature, not a bug. And uh, supposedly that was not intentional. And, um, but you're, you're really right. So, I mean, what you have to remember is, you know, first there was, in, in my experience with social, there was, a, there was a platform called Six Degrees that maybe got to like a million users. And then there was Friendster that got to 10 million users. And then there was MySpace that got to 100 million users. But even at the my, point of MySpace growing, when you signed up for MySpace, it was still at a time where you were told, don't use your real name on the internet. Don't use your real name. Like it was still a time where people were saying, I don't know, can I put my credit card into a web page? Like, is that safe? I mean, you have to remember at that point, there was still the skepticism around our data and personal identity being put in places. And so MySpace was built off of, you know, fake identity, um, aspirational identity. It wasn't who you were, it was who you really wanted to be. And if you wanted to be, you know, this fake name with all these random friends, and people even talk about MySpace, they're like, oh, they're not my friends, they're my internet friends. They're my MySpace friends. It's my topic, but it's my MySpace friends. Right. And it was very, very different. And the moment that I think, you know, Facebook saw that there's power in that network, but it's really powerful if it's hyper local where you actually know the people through, in his case, you know, the campus rollout of Facebook and then expanding upon that. It's just such a more powerful tool. Right. Period. And at that point, MySpace was already so big that going back to everybody being like, whoa, whoa, whoa get rid of your Internet friends. Like, let's let's get your real friends here. And, oh, you're not whatever, you know you know, Mr. Magic Mike now, now you're Mike Jones and we need to like change your identity and we have to change your profile URL. And, and we don't want all these clustered profiles with customization because they're hard to navigate. We just want everything standard. And suddenly it's like, we ended up, my just ended up on its heels, right? And I just think there wasn't a point where we're like, no, no, now we're the real identity platform. That journey had sailed. Like Facebook did it ex extremely well. And I didn't think that there was a moment, like, we tried, but it was like, oh, there's no way. Well, there's no way we're going to crush this gap, right? It was just, it was just too broad. What was the company in between? So Six Degrees got to like a, a million users. MySpace got to a hundred million. Facebook got to a billion. What was the 10 million? Um, Friendster. Friendster. So Friendster. Friend, Friendster was before MySpace. And I mean, I remember playing with Six Degrees being like, this is clever. And then Friendster had really cool profiles and people were using it for dating. It was still fake identity. MySpace went bigger, it brought in musicians, and there was that like, oh my God, I might get a message back from my favorite celebrity or my favorite artist so that I could listen to music, and then there was content. And, and then when Facebook came out with real identity, and then when they released the stream, that was like powerful, right? And suddenly MySpace replicating the stream, because MySpace was a profile-centric experience, right? You logged in and went to people's profile, you checked your bulletin boards, manipulated the top, right? Suddenly Facebook put everything on that single page, right? Which really messed up MySpace again, because MySpace's revenue was driven off banner ad consumption. So we needed you to consume a lot of pages through that experience where Facebook's like, no, no, single page stream, you know, and suddenly we're like, well, if we go to that, like how much revenue are we losing, right? And so, you know, they, they pioneered that stream and then, you know, then they released their open Facebook system of open login, allowing their profile to be distributed. And that was just such an impressive move. And then the Facebook platform, I mean, the ingenuity or the, you know, coming out of the company was incredible back then. Um, they just I'm did an excellent job. I'm reading the Facebook book right now um, mm -hmm. that just came out, and it's mm -hmm. unbelievable the, uh, the the speed at which they could ship new product. Yeah, so impressive. Like, impressive. Yeah. What's so funny now is I have young kids, and I spend a lot of time with Snapchat and the team at TikTok, and and we've you know been around so many of the social products, and now I see like the actual manifestation of what it does to a 12 year old, a 13 year old, a 16 year old on their day to day life. And like, there's a lot of negative consequences to these platforms, frankly, you know, and there's positives, but there's also a lot of negatives. And I think a lot of us are looking back being like, well, what, you know, what did we create here and where is this going? And, and what are the, you know, mental health concerns being created through these systems? And are there better ways to do it? And a lot of, uh, a lot of us are asking those questions these days. Do you think that something like Facebook has a positive or negative impact on the world? I think if you're uh, under a certain age, it's a pretty negative impact because if you think about it before Facebook, when you walked around your town, you maybe compared yourself to people that were within your five mile vicinity and there was this connectivity to those individuals. 
But suddenly, if you know you're logging to these social platforms and you're 14, 15, 16, you're comparing yourself to Kylie Jenner and billionaire teenagers that are living like Instagram worthy lives, like in a certain sense, you're being you're comparing yourself to an unobtainable goal, right? And suddenly you're like, why don't I? And how come I? And I think the result of that is just a lot for kids to handle, um, especially when they're in that moments of identity formation. So I think there's a pretty negative effect on that. I also think that like the ability now to like quickly bully people is just phenomenal. It's like bullying at the speed of light, right? Like we see it all the time where some event happens, somebody captured this event on video and then they upload it into a Snapchat broadcast and Instagram and the entire school now is aware of that event and it happens within like 45 seconds. So suddenly those local events that are positive or negative get exploded. You know, the circle that you compare yourself to is like a global circle of people that are potentially way outside your reach or socioeconomic, you know, purview. Um, and, you know, I think for, for identity purposes, it's going to be, it's really difficult for kids to consume. And, and I think parents maybe aren't aware of that. And so they're like, yeah, you're 12, like jump on these platforms. Right. And they may not be aware of what's actually happening to their kids. I think that's just an inherent lack of empathy because yeah. you don't have someone's face. I actually think you can make a comparison between the lack of empathy on social platforms, which causes bullying. Uh, and, and then you can compare that to a uh, decrease in empathy in the workplace today because of COVID. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. noticing that there's a lot more stress at in, inside of companies right now, because as like maybe a manager, you're basically just saying, Hey Mike, like I, can you turn this around? Can you do this quickly? And like, you're not, it's on Slack, right? So you're not seeing their facial interactions. Yeah. You're not seeing that. Like they're having a totally shit day and yeah. you're, and, and there's no facial interactions, which give, which makes it so that there's no empathy. So I a hundred percent agree. Like, I think that's exactly true, which is like, it's like if you had conflict with people over text messages or email, and then you meet with them in person, you can resolve that conflict and suddenly there's a human element to that conflict and you guys can, you know, you people can understand where you're at, but you're hundred percent right. If all your interactions through this sanitized, emotionless digital communication, whether it's consuming content through platforms or text messages or Slack or whatever, like, yeah, you lack that, that human connection and it's, and it's difficult. And, and then you take away people's faces and with masks and stuff and suddenly people just can't read each other. And, um, and we talk a lot about that as a family, just like, what does empathy mean and, and how do we increase empathy among, um, you know, youth? And I, and I think like right now, digital is contributing highly negatively to that. Yeah. I kind of think you can, like, I want to start talking about crypto a little bit. I think you can start to make a uh, comparison to crypto and say, there's all these crypto platforms out there right now that are saying, yeah. we're going to reach a billion users. We're a new DeFi platform. We're Coinbase. We're going to go get a billion users, but they, yeah. you know, Coinbase couldn't have happened if, you know, Mt. Gox didn't happen. Right. That's right. And so there's all, you know, there's all these platforms that build on each other. And I think, and I'm wondering if right now we're at the Facebook stage with some of these platforms, if we're at the MySpace stage and like really where we're at, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. No, I, I love that parallel because um, even for me, you know, I remember when I did my first kind of, uh, you know, manual, manual transaction off of an ETH wallet, right. And being like, wow, like I'm putting money in this thing that I control and I'm putting in this address of where I'm going to send this money you know, in ETH. And if I get it wrong, it's gone. There's no recovery for it. And what does gas mean? And like, I remember feeling like this is so foreign, right? This feels so dangerous, right? This feels so um, odd to me. And now I'm obviously super comfortable with it. Like I had to change to become comfortable with that level of technology. And I think that's, that's true for broad levels of crypto, whether you're thinking about do I like the idea of currencies not support, not controlled by governments? Do I like the idea of self custodying assets? Do I like do I like the idea of a of an object that might represent equity and value and transactions and utility? Like like there's a bunch of metaphors and paradigms that have to change. I think that crypto opens up, and it's about us changing to understand how to think of them more than just the technology. Yeah, we need great technology, and yeah, we need better consumer experiences, and why are NFTs the solution to showing people how to have a valuable object-oriented experience through token? But it's also it changing us so that we're comfortable with those things, right? And so I think that's, that's the moment that I'm really looking forward to is when people get comfortable. Yeah, I, I'm all in on DeFi right now. I'm really excited about what's being built on like Uniswap and Compound and Aave, and I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> But yeah, I agree. like I have been in the industry for quite a while um, yeah. and I still like if I'm sending a thousand bucks from my MetaMask wallet, I'm, st I'm still out here sending ten dollars and then a hundred dollars and then a thousand dollars. Right. Like, yeah, we're, we're, I've been in the industry for, for longer than a lot of people have. And like, we're still at that point. So, yeah, isn't that funny? I, I think it's important to remember that, like, 
you know, we need we need more IPOs, we need more public companies, we need a lot more people using Coinbase before things like some of these DeFi yeah. protocols can go mainstream. Well, it's even funny. I mean, like, I probably like you. I've been on Coinbase forever, and I went just the just like the other day to like deposit more funds in the Coinbase. And the interface is so fucking confusing, just to be candid. Like, I love Coinbase and I buy their public shares and I'm a huge supporter. But like, if you want to, if I go into Coinbase and I was like, how do I transfer my money again? And there used to be, I feel like be a transfer button or a bank button. Dude, like I have to go to my wallet and I have to find <laughs> US dollars, which aren't even a token that aren't even at the top of the list. I have to sort, I click on it, I click like deposit, then I have to click transfer. I'm mean, like, dude, like if a normal person came in here and they're like, I need my bank to put money to buy ETH in Coinbase, I think it's still really confusing, which is really weird. So I agree, we need, we need these tools to evolve and then we need people to get comfortable with them. I do the same thing as you. Like every time I'm doing a transfer, I'm just like, God, maybe I'll do a small amount first just to verify and verify and verify, even though I've done it hundreds and thousands yeah, of times at this yeah. point, you know, I still get nervous. It, you said something on an interview in 2019, you said, in, you said it's really important to remember whether you're a founder or you're an investor in the consumer world, the best products don't always win. It's not always mm -hmm. the best product that wins. It's distribution. It's, you know, it's a whole lot of other things. How do you apply this to crypto investing? Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, well, I mean, we, we see it all the time. And so like, you know, the, here's a great example. I bumped into some investor and they are just hot on some token protocol that I would feel that they have no knowledge of, but they are just swear to God, this is the answer, right? And I go to my team and I'm like, look, like I, I bumped in this guy, he's telling me this is the answer to like, whatever. They're like, oh, we evaluated all the code. We don't like the team, code's a piece of shit. Here's this alternative that's gonna crush it. Then you go to Twitter and you're like, yeah, but there's like 10,000 people tweeting about this thing that this is gonna be the winner. They're like, oh, the technology is so bad. Like you can't invest in this thing. Meanwhile, token price completely spikes, right? Companies now overcapitalized. Company now hires better devs, right? And so in that case, like, you look at this stuff, you know, I'm, you know it's not necessarily the best technology in the been. Yeah, it is distribution, and yeah, it is collaborative support and community and features and products and ecosystems, right, that have to all be behind it. There's tons of examples where the best technology is not the winning technology, right? So there, there are all those other pieces, and crypto 100% is that story. One that comes to mind is, um... Uh, I have the founder of Chainlink coming on the podcast yeah, soon. Sure. And, you know, Chainlink, I, like, I remember 2017, this was before I launched Blockworks. I'm sitting at like my other day job. I worked at this data analytics company called SciSense. The sales yeah. guy next to me was like, you got to, you know, I heard about this thing on Reddit called Chainlink and like everybody was just, you know, yep. it was a quote unquote like shit project, right? Like, you know, I don't, yep. I, I should think of a better way to describe it if their founders coming on the podcast, but like. You know, now here we are in 2021 and Chainlink is powering the, it's the Oracle behind a lot of these DeFi platforms, right? And so yep. like, was it a great product back then? I can probably say no for a right. while, but like they mm -hmm. just had the community and some of the capital as well to, to persist and the founding team to persist. Yep. I, I mean, that is the exact example I would think about. So you know, my, my, my technical traders and engineers did not like Chainlink. My, tw you know, Twitter marketing people were like Chainlink's blowing up, you know, but we didn't have deep conviction. I own some, but I didn't like go deep. And yeah, like, it looks to me like Chainlink's going to be a monster, you know? And, you know, according to my guys, like there's better technologies out there, but at this point, I'm not sure there's going to be a bigger market cap alternative. And we see that all the time in, in crypto. And I, I'd be really curious when you interview that CEO, people that came to me talking about Chainlink, or people that had no exposure to crypto. It wasn't like these are people that were early ETH adopters. Or they no, it was, it was Reddit. Size. It was like 4chan, yeah. like weird, yeah, like the, the depths dude, of the internet. I, like. I had like a 55-year-old guy that, you know, owned manufacturing plants. And his intro into crypto was buying Chainlink at like sub 10 cents or something. And he was like, Mike, I made more on owning Chainlink than I did off of my entire career owning manufacturing plants. And I'm kind of like... How did you find your way to Chainlink? So whatever they did to bring that product forth and aggregate these communities, like they did a great job. So you, you've also described Facebook and, and uh, MySpace as more entertainment than utility. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you mean? And like, and then Google yeah. is more utility than entertainment. Like, what do you, what do you mean by that in web 2.0? Well, I mean, what I think through is like, what are the tools that I absolutely can't live without? So like, you know, you could turn off 
you know, I don't, I don't have cable coming in my house anymore, but, um, in theory, you could turn off my cable, but you can't turn off my power. You know, you could turn off my cable, but you can't turn off my water, you know? And so a certain sense for me, like Google has hyper retention with me because, and I don't even think like, I, yeah, Google is obviously an epic search product, but Gmail for me is absolutely critical. You know, their photos product is critical for me. Their drive product is critical for me, their slides product. So like those are products, but I, I can never leave them. I can't go a day without touching those products. They're absolute utilities for me. I'd argue Dropbox is a utility for me. Like I'm engaged with Dropbox. Those products are ones that I touch every day, whether I want to or not, because they're absolutely critical to my day to day. I can skip days consuming social content because it is entertainment. Like I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to get, you know, Slack is utility for me. I absolutely have to be on Slack. But if I don't log into Facebook today or don't consume Instagram or TikTok, like my life is no, no, no better or worse. Like my job isn't affected in any real negative way. So, you know, a lot of times when I look at these products, I think about retention and the ultimate retention is utilities because they're things you can really never walk away from because they're critical for your day-to-day -day digital life. I've never thought about utilities in the private sector like that. Like Google is a utility for your life. I mean, arguably, I mean, I would argue Amazon is almost that for me too. Like, yeah, I could replace yeah. Amazon and go to my store, but yeah, look at your credit card bill. I can assure you yeah. it's a utility. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, from a value chain proposition, like yes, Gmail and Slack maybe make me money because they facilitate business and transactions, but Amazon saves me time and time is ultimately the most valuable thing. So like, if I can spend more time with my family or my more time working by not having to go down to Target and do a bunch of shopping or whatever, then that's a very valuable you know, accessory to my life, right? Arguably one of the most important because it saves me so much time. So how do you apply that thesis around entertainment versus utility into crypto investing? Well, I think like right now we haven't, I mean, I have yet to see something that's a, and granted, listen, when I started in crypto, especially when we started building products, we really took a consumer view, right? Yes, we did investments into banks and financial infrastructure, which is, I think, going to be great. But, you know, I really did look at it from a consumer perspective. And there's nothing right now that I'm touching from a consumer perspective that relies on the blockchain in any meaningful way where I can't avoid it day to day. You know, the first project that I spent a lot of time personally building was we built a, a, D, a product called D-Mail. It's gone now and there's other replications of it, but basically it was a Chrome extension that took your inputted email and took the text and put it through a dual layer encrypted blockchain where the recipient was the only person with the key to unlock the email. And the thought was, if I'm sending you a message, I don't want anyone else to be able to see that message. I don't want you to be able to forward that message. And if that message is stored on a server, no one should be able to view it. So it authenticated that the receiver was the only person that could view the message and the sender could only send it, would only send it to the specified receiver. So it was an encrypted email solution that ran on top of Gmail through a Chrome plugin, right? And it was all through, uh, we used Hyperledger because Hyperledger happened to have a dual chain system. It's very cool. No one fucking cared, <laughs> you know, like, like and, it, and it was like my first attempt at like, okay, well, people should be cared about, you know, security and encryption and hacking super bad and, you know, emails are liabilities. So why don't we create a distributed, a per, you know, this is a perfect, you know, use, use case for blockchain. Um, no one cared. Right. And so we took the project, we took, we took it offline. So I, I still, from a day-to-day -day perspective, don't do that. Now, when my medical records are stored in an encrypted blockchain that I myself control, and then I can, you know, give access to my doctor or a hospital based on certain parameters. I love that idea. If it's an insurance company where there's rules set up with a smart contract for me to be insured and to do claims, totally love it. If it's my credit score where it's not controlled by a company, but it's controlled on side of a blockchain where I have that control and I grant access to certain things and I control that data, perfect use case, right? So I, I do see those use cases or transferring the title of my house, selling you a car, fractionally borrowing against the value of my house whenever I want at my own terms through a distributed DeFi marketplace. I love those things. I don't know about you, but I don't use any of those things yet on crypto because I haven't found a consumer experience that's really doing it to the level that I would want to bring into my life. It reminds me of, uh, you remember 2017? Yeah, I was on the consumer end of a lot of these like pitches. Is like you yeah. know, Facebook on the blockchain, Uber on the blockchain, Spotify, yep. the crypto version of Spotify. I'm sure yep. you were on the, probably the venture side of those pitches. We saw, we saw all those deals, yeah. At the end of the day, no one fucking cares that it's on, it's, it's on the blockchain. No, nobody, nobody cares in the slightest, right? Because yep. it's about the distribution and the network effects. It's That's not right. about getting paid in crypto to go click on an ad. 
because realistically right. you can do that without crypto. So and I mean, what also you realize is uh, one of the big benefits of the blockchain is it is secure, and you do have control over your own data. But then what you also realize is most people, most people just don't really care enough to go through those extra steps. So even though it's the right best technical solution for privacy controls or identity controls or profile management, the reality of getting consumers to change a behavior to do it, I think is really low. And so I don't think we've seen, I mean, NFTs are the lightest form of experience that you could probably touch where we're actually seeing, you know, quote unquote, consumer level adoption. We did a startup at one point that was doing music venue ticketing and event ticketing. You know, it essentially the product failed, but it was such a good idea because again, it's an independent object that I can put into a secondary market through a digital transfer. Totally makes sense. Again, never could get mass consumer adoption because we never closed big venues to essentially use the product. So there's a lot of great use cases, but nothing that I think has gotten to scale. And many of the use cases that are great around security, consumers don't care enough about. Um, do you use any stable coins like USDC? I mean, I do. I mean, we do a lot of active trading. And so, of course, yeah, we're always trading in and out of stable coins because it's a more effective way to like keep our balances where we want them to be during high, high, high moments of volatility. The, the reason I ask is because like that might be the first thing that's starting to feel like a utility for me uh, as a mm. business with Blockworks. Like we have, you know, we are an ad and sponsorship based business, uh, which yeah. honestly would be fun to talk to you about because of your MySpace yeah. days. But, sure. um, you know, we get payments in usually wires, right? And, yeah. and actually still a lot of physical checks, which is a pain in the ass. And, yeah. n- you know, now that we started accepting USDC, it I, I actually get frustrated when clients don't have a USDC account set up. And when they want yeah. to send us a check or a wire, I'm like, guys, yeah. like we're using USDC here. It's 2021. What are you doing? So yeah. that, that does start to feel like maybe the first sort of utility of crypto. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I haven't, you know, we, we've, we've had a few investors that have come to us saying, we want to invest in your fund. We want to come in through USDC or we want to come through ETH contributions. And we found a way to facilitate it. Um, we at one point looked at some business that was trying to create like a billing platform that was all around USDC, USDT and automated rules. So in theory, it's like you would send them a smart contract that they would sign that would say every time this audio file was listened to through, you know, an offline Oracle, then it automatically hit the contract and automatically paid you. So there's no human intervention and payment. Love the theory. Again, haven't seen it put into motion yet, but like automated robo payments based on authoritative verified actions. Super interesting. Like, I still can't believe the work I have to go through to set up an automated payment system, even just for my general bills personally, you like, and half of them expire and it's a pain in the ass and hard to track. And there should be a singular system for all that, right? Like there's a bunch of innovation to be had there once you digitally allow people to move money effectively. Yeah. I think you could argue that the other uh, thing that might start to become like utility is, um, I I just got a mortgage. I got my first mortgage from Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. Complete pain in the ass. I run an LLC and have too much capital in crypto. And so Wells Fargo yeah. was not stoked with uh, my, my mortgage plan. And, yeah. you know, you look at something, you know, it took, took months to get this mortgage and you look at something like Ave or mm-hmm. Compound where I can get yeah. a mortgage, you know, granted it's an over collateralized mortgage right now, but at some point you can probably do under collateralized mortgages in yep. 30 seconds instead of yep. 90 days. Yep. No, I love it. Like, I mean, I, I've played with those platforms. I've borrowed against them. We've created leverage on those on those systems. And like the idea that, the, I mean, what, what we all want to get to is that there's a digital record of the things we own with a real-time value on those things. And I can borrow against the aggregate of those objects at any time. I want a digital copy of my title that reflects the current value of that car. And if I want to borrow against it within seconds, I should be able to do it through DeFi, then pay that down you know, and it avoids all the paperwork and everything you went through because the title is collateralized through a contract, right? So, but I think the first step on that is how do you get, you know, how does your house get represented digitally within a token or within a contract that allows you then to leverage that contract? We saw it happen with Proppy and some interesting things happening abroad. The question is with the U.S. legal system, the U.S. title system and the real estate system, do we think that, you know, is that is that a 10 or 20 year journey? Is that a never journey? You know, I mean, there's so much litigation, liability and structure around paper titles. I'll be really curious, you know, who can onboard that into a digital form. Yeah. And to kind of extend that out, I think one thing that's interesting is um, like it's starting to feel like there's a convergence of like your checking account, your savings account, your brokerage account, your NFT account, your yeah. collectibles accounts, your real estate yep. accounts, like as things start to get tokenized 
and yeah. go move on to a blockchain. It starts like the concept that I've got this, you know, two different bank accounts. I've got a business bank account. I've got a personal bank account. I've got four different places mm-hmm. where I hold crypto. I've got two different NFT wallets. I've got my, my, you know, MetaMask. That, like it, it makes no sense. Right. Yeah, and it does feel like the only reason why you have like a checkings account and a brokerage account is because mm-hmm. of the financial incentives of legacy banks. Yeah, uh, that's right. Um, I don't, I, know, I don't really have a question there, but that's, I'm just thinking no, about that I these mean, days. There's so, many, there's so much fees and so much revenue for financial structures around having you have a lot of different accounts to keep those assets separate. But you're exactly right. Like, If my checking account is overfunded, it should be investing those dollars on my behalf and I could ch- you know, describe the r- risk threshold, whether it's going into equities or going into debt or bonds or, or into general savings, right? And, and it's so funny, right? Because you think to yourself, well, if I deposit a bunch of money in the bank, the bank's making money loaning my money out, but I'm actually paying to deposit that money. So I'm paying them the privilege to give them the money, but then they're taking the asset I give them and they're giving it to somebody else and also making money on that. And I can move the asset from this bucket to this bucket as a savings account. And now I get paid a little bit for them to hold the money, but they're still also loaning it out to somebody else. Right. And you start saying, well, like, you know, you're, you're making money off of my assets. So there's got to be something funky in there. Um, but there's a, like I said, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of structured gold, not to, not to have that change. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Let's start talking about the venture side of things. So you guys have mm-hmm. um, incubated some of my favorite companies. So Dollar Shave, I'm, I'm a fellow Emory nice. history alum, oh, which, nice. uh, the Dollar Shave Club guy, I'm pretty sure he was an Emory history alum. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you guys, so you guys have incubated and, in, you know, first money into a bunch of different companies. Are you yeah. starting to incubate more crypto companies? And if not, why not? So we, 10 years ago, we started the venture fund. It originally was a studio. Now it's a studio and a fund. And to your point, we kind of, we collaborate on maybe almost 30 companies a year and maybe half of them kind of make their way to the fund and a bunch of others gets washed out. And over the lifetime of science, I have the list somewhere, but I think we've tried like 200 companies or something where like, and you know, they all, they all sent a good paper when we started and then you test them out and some good traction, some founders fall apart and whatever. And you end up with some gems in there and that really drives the venture side of it. Um, Wait, actually, sorry, Mike, before we jump into crypto, can you actually explain to folks what a studio is and how it's different than a venture fund? Sure. I mean, a venture fund kind of assumes that the moment you walk in the door to pitch that partnership, you have a completely spot on strategy. You have a fully architected team. Maybe you already have some traction. Maybe you've raised some friends and family money to kind of bootstrap the business. But when you pitch the business, you're pitching that exact business. Like it has to be in somewhat final form. You know, angel investors are going to, you know, obviously guide you a little bit, but the higher up the food chain you go, the more it needs to be solid. You know, a studio environment or an incubator or a whatever you call it um, generally would be accepted that there's going to be a group of full-time individuals at that entity. They're going to work with you almost like a co-founder. They're going to provide free, free time, free resources. They might even provide free liquid capital to operate the business in some form with the goal of solidifying that plan. You know, and, and then the benefit to you is that in theory, you end up with a better plan, a better business, an earlier bench team, hopefully better metrics. And what that should result in is when you go to raise money, you know, you'll raise money at a more favorable valuation and maybe they'll help you with the raise and the raise process will be smoother and your idea will really take off versus you doing it in essence in isolation, right? The downside for you is you're probably going to give up some level of capital or some level of equity for that. So you're going to give them some common shares or some founder shares and let them invest at a preemptive round price that's just somewhat favorable, right? Um, but when it works, you know, you get a liquid death and you get a Dollar Shave Club or a Play Versus or one of our portfolio companies. And even like Hems came out of a studio. Or, so there's a bunch of good examples. I mean, Rover essentially came out of two studios. We did Dog, Dog VK, another studio did Rover. You know, they merged, they SPAC, they're public now. Great results. So you can get some really good multi-billion dollar, you know, exits off of the back of that, um, that brain trust at the beginning. Um, some founders really like that level of collaboration. Some founders want to do it on their own. There's no single right path. So, okay. So now extending that out into your guys' strategy, I guess, zooming out of just the studio, how do you, how do you, how does science like play crypto? How like, right. So science uh, really has like, kind of, yeah. we have three, we have three areas of focus. So we have our venture fund and venture studio. We have a late stage SPAC fund that deals with obviously public market equities and such. And then we have a crypto fund, right? In 2016 or 17, we launched our own crypto fund. We raised a dedicated fund. It happened to be a Reg D tokenized fund. 
It was the second one right behind uh, Blockchain Capital. And with that fund, the target goal was to incubate, invest into crypto projects, right? And we did a bunch of those investments. We did a bunch of those incubations, right? And so inside that fund is both equities, it's um, tokens, and those tokens get distributed in a liquid sense out to the shareholders. And then we actually have an actively managed trading strategy inside that fund um, that holds various tokens and such. So we do have an incubator around blockchain technologies. We do see a bunch of projects. Um, you know, the ones that have worked for us are ones that are really on the fintech side. We have not yet seen a consumer project that we feel has worked, um, either not one that we, we got involved in, invested in, or, or incubated. Uh, we're still looking for them, and so it's still open. So there's capital there. We still look at a bunch of projects. We're still interested in working with founders. Um, but to date, the most successful components of that strategy have been our actively managed strategy, which operates like a quant fund, and our you know equity holdings that um, are in with more fintech oriented products and then a series of tokens that we invested in and hold. Can you talk more about the quant fund and what that looks like? Sure. So, um, you know, we made an investment with a platform that basically helps traders manage um, trading strategies. And that exposed us to a variety of different traders doing a bunch of different strategies. We started spending a lot of time on quantitative trading. Um, it's been a passion of mine and a passion of, of a number of the partners there. I think like in a world where, as you would imagine, there's thousands of token pairings and really hard to understand the underlying value beyond Twitter armies um, talking about different token. Um, it felt like there needed to be a way to kind of monopolize on the, on the volatility. Um, you know, through one of our investments, they introduced us to a handful of quantitative traders, you know, and we've been working with them for, you know, at this point, um, you know, certain traders months and certain traders years um, and just found really good results from that. You know, it takes a fairly substantial engineering effort and, and a lot of complex structures to do it effectively. But um, for us, it's been a, a good good place to spend time. Granted, if you and I had you know, whatever bought a you know chain link two years ago, maybe it would have been a better return. So there's lots of other ways to, ways to win in that market. But um, at least for me mentally, knowing that it, I, I found that we met with so many founders with so many pitches I really find it hard in the crypto world to pick the winners, just to be candid. Like, you know, there's, we, we, we went through so much of it. And the other, you also have this negative signaling that so many people in the crypto world make so much money off crypto. It's also really hard not only to know who the winners are, but who are going to stay working on their projects, right? Like, because if you're in a world where that token you helped launch had massive price appreciation, you know, you start asking yourself, like, is this person going to be more worried about managing their own capital or are they going to be worried about building their project? So we've had a hard time picking winners and we're still looking for winners and still looking for investments. But on the, on the token side, I've, I've, I personally really align with a quantitative trading strategy. I think it's the right answer. The thing that I find most interesting about venture investing in crypto is that oftentimes it's liquid venture, which technically is a hedge fund. So That's right. how do you, like, how do you align the incentives? I guess, how do you align founder, investor incentives when you're investing in a liquid token that you can actually then sell? So, I mean, a lot of venture funds can't invest in liquid tokens because it creates a tax liability and it's something their LPs really won't allow them to do, right? So most, I would argue most funds probably can't do that. Um, our fund was set up to invest into those. If we were not talking about the tokenized world and we were talking about just standard venture, if you started a company and that company became worth in some venture around a billion dollars, right? And you were still living in like your mom's basement and you were like, hey, I own 30% of this billion dollar company. I want to move out of the basement. I want to sell some shares. You would go to your board, right? And the board would say, we're going to let you sell some shares. We're not going to let you sell $100 million worth of shares. We're going to let you sell X dollars worth of shares. And there'd be some agreement with you because the board to its right doesn't want to see you over liquid so that you're no longer motivated to build wealth and value for the shareholders of the company, right? And some board members are really supportive of founders selling secondary, and some board members are not supportive at all at founders selling secondary shares. So it really depends. Enter the tokenized world where in essence, there's not equity, but there's some value that gets inflated through progress through token value that is completely connected to founders. And as an investor, one thing I found is it's really, it takes a lot of time for us to evaluate the token lockup and grant schedules of the founding team, right? So if you and I were looking at buying into an early project or buying a bunch of tokens in the project, we might want to know like, well, out of the top 10 people, like how many of the tokens are liquid now? When do they get released? Like we'd have to do all that analysis. And I will 100% tell you that the result 
of that from the first wave of ICOs was a lot of founders ditched their projects, right? Like I had founders coming in who, you know, were flying in on private jets to meet me about their project when they hadn't ever accomplished really anything with their project no at all. Yeah, no product. Right. And I'm like, wait, why are you like, I'm not flying private to meet you. Like, why are you like, why are you spending 50,000 bucks for this meeting? This is crazy. Right. And they're like, oh, well, you know, Lambo time. And I'm just like, okay, look at, this my, is... look at the price of my token. Go check. Right. Out exactly. They're account, like, like, oh, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're a $6 billion token company now. And I'm like, but like, who's using your shit? Like, and so, so what happened, right? Like if you and I look through the amount of those kind of startups, like how, what percentages are feasible going forward? Really? You know, it's yeah. a small number. Right. And I mean, a little bit of this happened, I think in the first dot-com bubble, which I was a little young for, I didn't quite hit it where companies were IPOing at the end of their first year of operations. And then again, they had that happen. Um, but at least there was some governance on it and there's a little bit more clarity. I find on the token projects, there's just not clarity. Who has the tokens? How much do you have? Have you sold it? Can you sell it any time? And like, the general presumed is like, well, you know, we're just leveling the playing field. We can sell our stuff if, this, if the value goes up. It's like, yeah, but I'm investing you to build something effective. I want to see car title transfers through the, you know, through digital blockchain transfers. Like, why don't we be excited when that actually happens? Not just when you build the infrastructure tech and you're hoping for adoption. So I think the result was bad. I think it was a bad result. Yeah. I mean, here's where it gets even more interesting when you get the um, emergence of DAOs and you get protocols that basically have token lockups. And then they say, actually, as a founding team, uh, wh whatever the incentives are for doing this, right? Oftentimes yeah. it's to like, you know, have the community play a part, but like really what's happening yeah. behind the scenes is it's a race to not get regulated. And you basically look at these founders and they're saying, yeah, I'm taking a step back. I'm decentralizing the company. I'm not going to yeah. be the leader anymore. And you're like, well, shit, I put a lot of money into you because you're the founder. And yep. they're like, but this is what you do, Mike. This is this is called a DAO. We're in crypto. And I mean, and, and even as you were saying around the like, is it a checking account? Is it a credit card? Is it a bond investment vehicle? Or is it an equity investment? The same thing are really true in tokens. It's like, okay, do I own equity in the company? Or do I own a liquid token speculative value? Or do I own a credit for the service the company's providing? Or do I own a vote for the DAO's function of the company? Like. What is that token, right? And that's why also, like you saw that note today where it was like, was it the OCC that said that SEC didn't have the power to regulate crypto this morning or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or some statement yeah. or like, yeah. or no, no, like, CF, one of the, CFT, uh, yeah, CF, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of them, exactly. I think what of them said, yeah. it was CFTC, you're exactly right. And so the thing is because everyone's like, well, what is it? Like, like if, if my local coffee shop releases a token, right? Is it a credit for lattes? Is it an ownership in the company? Is it a future value for distributions off of profit? Is it a vote into what they're going to change their menu? Do I own part of the lease? Do I own part of the, like, what is it? And so, you know, we have this thing now that I don't think anyone knows how to regulate. And to your point, you know, it's comp it's really complicated. So like, if you're buying into these projects, you know, with one understanding and a lot of general investors getting in, they kind of think they're buying equity, but now they understand maybe they're not, they're buying tokens and speculative, but I think it becomes even more complicated with DAOs, right? Yeah. And so um, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, the one thing I love right now is just the use cases that you and I ran through. I just like to see them live. You know what I mean? I like, I would just be psyched if this stuff worked, you know, and my concern is we have this great tech, massive market cap. It's being effectively used inside fintech, which I totally get banking and international transfers, and currency, etc. Totally get that. But from a consumer perspective, outside of NFTs, I just like to see it work. You know, it's just a really cool thing. I'd like to see it happen, you know? Yeah. Uh, I want, let's talk about that in a second, the utility. I just want to push back. I, I'm like stuck on people not liking crypto because it's speculative. Because mm -hmm. if you look at something, I think a lot about this. Like if you think of, if you look at a stock, like what is, what, what was a stock supposed to represent? It's supposed to represent a claim on future cash flows. Sure. Now what is, now what, like we can all agree on that. Like now what a stock and you have dividends and things like that. But now look at something like Facebook stock, right? You've got. Uh, actually, I haven't looked at Facebook stock in a while, so I, I hope I'm still right. But like no dividends and you basically have no voting controls. So why do you buy Facebook stock? You're speculating on the price of Facebook stock going up. You're not voting. There's no governance and you're not getting a future claim on cash flows. You're speculating that the stock of Facebook will go up and that more people yeah. will buy Facebook higher than you. So it's no different than buying something like anything like Ethereum, Bitcoin, anything like that. Right. But the difference, right, is 
you and I can look inside on a quarterly basis to Facebook to understand revenue growth, revenue structure, net revenue. We can look at management comp compensation. We can look at ownership shares. We can look at whether management is selling. You know, we have a somewhat you know curated and transparent view into the operations of the business, and then you and I can decide. Oh, well, based on last year's quarter's revenue, is this the right value for the stock? And you and I can make an independent choice. The question is, if you and I do that same analysis over a token company, are we able to see it? Can we see the operating budget for Chainlink? Can we see the revenue projection for Matic? Do we understand the founding team? Is there a governance? Do we trust the board of advisors? Do we trust the board of directors? Can the CEO sell their tokens? In what countries are they being used? What, you know, so I would argue that it's true, they're both speculative, but one, you have much greater depth of detail to analyze for the other one, you, it's just not as transparent. That, that's why one of the most crucial things that needs to get built right now is the data in the space, yeah. right? Like, like hypothetically, it's actually more transparent because it's all on chain, but true. it's, it's just hard to, actually, it's hard to understand. Like I'm, I'm not that technical and like there are a lot of people less technical than me and more technical, but like it's still really hard to find. And it's really hard. Once you find it, it's really hard to use. Well, and, so. but I don't think that yet, yes, you and I, in theory, could pull up chain analysis, look at all the holders of Matic, try to identify the founders, understand their movements of token value. But I still don't think we can see budgets. I don't think we can see revenue. You know, we can read some press releases about adoption, but, but yeah, like there's a bunch of stuff that isn't transparent in there that, that just makes it a more difficult thing to analyze. Now, here's the other thing is you can argue the thing about a currency, though. You'd be like, well, if you're buying South African, is it Rand? Like, why? Like, wh what are you doing to understand the value of that currency? And how are you, you know, so there are other asset classes I think do have less, that have less, you know, transparency to the operations. But I think the transparency that we have around standard companies for shares, it's just, it's just an easier thing to understand. Yeah. But I think where this goes, um, uh, now we're just kind of speculating on speculation is uh, where this, where this goes is more, more tools and actually hopefully more transparency like ideally you should be able to see exact like like let's use uniswap for example you should see exactly how much revenue uniswap is spitting out every single day you Agreed. should see exactly how many users you should see exactly yeah. how much you know hayden and his team have locked up how much andreessen owns like exactly what that breakdown looks like. agreed and um, the other thing that frustrates me is can you and i think uh, like if you and i think of the tokens that have had mass movements and adoption are any of them tied to consumer usage or revenue, or are all the price speculation, appreciation, or depreciation tied to Twitter and Reddit and publicity and pure speculation? Like, is there, I always ask my team, I'm like, is there anyone driving revenue transactions that's directly resulting in token appreciation? And maybe in the NFT space, we can kind of point to it. And certainly with ETH, you can be like, well, everyone's building on ETH. And so like, that's gonna probably drive up some value. Um, but in a bunch of others, I haven't been able to point to it yet. Let's talk more about utility and like actual usage. Right now, it's just a whole bunch of speculation, and it feels like an amazing digital casino where people mm -hmm. are, you know, making a bunch of money, and it's really fun. But like, what is the real world usage? I guess you would say like, there's yeah. no ticketing, there's no medical records, there's none of that stuff. Does that matter? Right. And like, will we actually get there? Well, it's it's interesting because if you and I go back to like, well, when the internet first came out and it was websites, where did, where did everyone spend time? And it was like porn and gambling. So like, let's remove porn from the equation, but from a gambling perspective, I bet there's, you know, to your point, even with gaming and maybe Axiom Infinity, like gambling will de gambling can have day-to-day -day adoption right now. It's perfect for prediction markets. It's perfect for gambling, right? And I suspect that it'll just take a lot of time. The thing that I think we're going to butt up against is a lot of the great use cases that I like, which are around, you know, objects of value and leverage, leveraging those objects and debt, et cetera. There's a lot of legal structure around, right? And so... It's, it'd be, it's a lot easier for you and I to decide to build a game where as we win, we earn tokens, we can invest it back into the ecosystem. And there's this whole system of, of whatever game inside blockchain, much harder for us to go and take on, you know, home titles, considering it's a state by state basis with totally different legality, right? That feels like a much more difficult thing. So, you know, I think if you and I were making a chart of like, what's when, you'd probably write out all these ideas. You put it on a timeline, not knowing when the time starts or ends, just knowing which ones are the most complicated with city by city you know, governance up to like, oh, I can launch this mass market tomorrow and it totally works. And that's probably your spectrum of the path of what gets rolled out. Can we talk about crypto SPACs for a second? Hmm, sure. Well, what, what's coming down the pike next 12 to 18 months? Like what's, what, what are you excited about in the SPAC world and how does crypto tie into that? There's like eToro and like Kraken and like, I don't know how deep into the crypto SPAC world you are, but. I, I mean, it's funny. I got insight. pitched, um, I got sent a, a crypto SPAC investing opportunity yesterday. So We've seen it. We've looked at it. And just so everyone knows, like 
basically there's a few ways to become public on a U.S. stock exchange or an international stock exchange. Um, there's a traditional way, which is going through a banker and all this process. And there happens to be another way, which is called a SPAC. And just so everyone understands, the way it basically works is a SPAC effectively is a company that exists on an exchange like the NASDAQ or the NYSE that has cash in it and no operations essentially, and um, has an operational team, but it, it's really just a cash container. And that, that entity, that SPAC has a typically 24 month window to essentially acquire a business into its SPAC. Um, and so for a company like Kraken or FTX or uh, whatever, whatever, Rover that happened to just SPAC, um, you know, it's a different way to enter into the public markets. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages to doing a SPAC versus other traditional ways. So it doesn't fit every company, but for the companies it fits, it's a very effective way for them to go public. Um, but after you've gone through a SPAC and you've gone through what is called a de-SPAC process and you are now public, you are just a public company. And you have all the same rigors of reporting and credentials, et cetera, that you're going to need to be a public company. So the question on, you know, is there, is there, you know, there's not really crypto SPACs, right? There's going to be SPACs that will probably target companies that are operationally in crypto. And then the question is, do they have the reporting requirements needed to be a public company, which many of them probably won't because it'll be really hard. Will they pass all the, you know, all the checks and balances of being a U.S. public company um, around governance and the way they operate? And then will the public market receive them effectively and reward them with a positive share price, right? And so I haven't looked at Kraken's books. I have spent time with a bunch of uh, CEOs of, of big uh, of big crypto companies, but I haven't gotten to the point of, of evaluating those businesses because our SPAC is not focused on targeting a crypto-based business. But do we think that there's one out there? I mean, absolutely. There'll definitely be companies that go public via SPAC and they'll be crypto focused and um, hopefully they'll have everything they need to be an effective public business. Yeah. Is a SPAC, I mean, I know what a SPAC is, but like, is it basically just a pipe at a large scale? Um, SPACs typically use pipes, you know, in order to basically bridge uh, the cash needed for them to for them to be. So pipe would be a, a, a was it, it's a private interest in the public entity. Is that right? Yeah, private um, investment in private the investment in the public entity. Yeah. So it's a, it's, you know, it's supplemental. But I guess you raise the capital beforehand and you've got a, what two years or something to go buy you got two years right so it's basically it's it's a company waiting to acquire a business effectively yeah yeah why did SPACs blow up all of a sudden I mean SPACs have been around for a long time they were typically run by bankers um, and they were typically used for less desirable assets Um, they blew up frankly because our collective friend Shamath you know brought out Virgin Galactic with a really smart team of you know of board members and operators and the public markets received it well and suddenly the feeling on SPAC became hyper positive. Um, and that was also combined with the fact that you have a lot of late stage companies now with hundreds of millions of dollars of annual revenue that want to find their way into the public markets. And so you have a new vehicle, you have an old vehicle that now feels new again, that's positive and favorable, combined with a huge roster of companies that are ready to go public. Um, and then there's some other benefits around SPACs, around how you talk about growth, et cetera, put all that together and suddenly it becomes a very favorable climate for it. Um, and I think that like have going through all different processes of going public, I think, um, I think SPACs are really effective tools for the right company. So we're big believers and we'll continue to build this SPAC practice. If I try to make the counter argument though, on a SPAC, like an, like an IPO is for like the, like the, the creme de la creme, right? Like the best companies can do an IPO. And then like, you know, some companies do like a direct listing, but it feels like there's just so much money sloshing around that there are people so desperate for yield that they push their, their risk profile further and further out on the risk curve. And so now you're going to have a lot of companies like SPACing, if that's a verb, uh, that probably shouldn't actually be public companies. Is this a concern? Is this... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think if you have companies that are really easy to understand, direct listings are great. I mean, like Spotify was a beautiful direct listing. Like they, they kind of carved that path and it's a product that everyone really understood, right? I think sometimes you have complicated companies that are hard to understand, or you have companies that have really rapid future growth trajectories and they want to benefit from exposing people to that rapid future growth trajectory, you know, through their roadshow when they're talking to investors. And you also have, frankly, like the IPO process is, is a very long, expensive process. Um, SPACs can be much quicker. Um, it can be equal to or even certain times less or maybe more in that expense. And it can have favorable valuation metrics. And you end up with strategic board members and strategic operational teams that you might not get through going through a traditional IPO. So like we have a very specific focus at science that lends certain expertise to types of companies. You know, when we talk to companies about SPACing, 
you know, they're typically looking at that talent that very favorable, something they want to work with. So, um, so it's, it's not, like I said, it's not like one path is better than the other, or one has a better result than another, right? It just certain paths going to be better for different companies. But to your point, there are a lot of SPACs out there and they're going to be looking for a lot of deals and not all those deals may be favorable. So, and because there's a 24 month timeline on it, you know, people could, people could choose to do less favorable deals in, into those vehicles. There are some checks and balances that prevent it, but it's possible. The other company I wanted to ask you about, and then we can start wrapping things up, is Protego. Protego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you and uh, uh, Peter, uh, mm-hmm. I keep seeing talking about this on Twitter. So what's the deal with this company? Why is it? Exciting? I mean, it's. I mean, it's an interesting company that started with a, and I need to get some of the technicalities wrong here, but it started as a uh, digital trust company that has the ability to basically custodian both traditional and digital assets. Um, and it was specifically under a single state uh, with some reciprocity with other states. They were granted a federal trust charter. You can certainly search up Protigo and, and OCC and, and learn about the, the things that they have the ability to do. But they're one of very few companies. Just as you would imagine, whether we're talking about the future of crypto being interbank transfers or digital stock certificates or digital title transfers of homes, there's going to be some custodian you know, banks set up that are going to, need to hold these assets and be that connectivity between ownership and and the government and regulations, et cetera. And they happen to have a really unique charter. And so we're pretty excited about them. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they've raised a lot of money. They'll continue to raise a lot of money. They have some massive partnerships. Um, and to be honest, like it's a very heavy lift. So this isn't a, uh, let's spin up a AWS instance and launch a bank. You know, it's a, let's work with the highest vendors with the most complex systems on the planet and put incredibly smart people around it. I feel completely outgunned in the conversations. The, uh, the team behind it is incredibly smart. So it'll be a meaningful thing, I think for, for science and many of our fund vehicles have equity exposure to it. And so that's possible, you know, that's positive for us. In doing research for the podcast, it is clear mm-hmm. you like to stay busy. Um, mm-hmm. you've got the Quan fund and the studio and the venture arm and, uh, you know, it sounds like you guys used to dabble with mining and I don't know if you still do, we don't have to get into that and you've got the SPACs, but I think just on a personal note, like as a founder trying to build a business and feeling like I'm, I've got a whole, a million things going on all the time. What are some ways that you manage everything and keep it all together? Well, the first is like, I try to build you know, absolutely best of breed teams around me. And then I empower those, those individuals at a true partnership level to, to run with the missions. Right. And I, you know, I hopefully compensate them extremely fairly. Like we, we want great people around us that can be very financially successful if things work. Um, so I've been fortunate because I've worked with a lot of people over my career and I can pick those best people and I can put them around me and, and build great things. Um, and so that's really fun for me. So all those things have people that obviously head them on a day-to-day basis. And I get the pleasure of jumping into strategy on different needs, you know, across that portfolio. Um, the second piece is I often think to myself, like where I can make the absolute most difference in these businesses. And I try to spend my time, you know, in those moments. So, and I think that's a constant refinement when you're looking at your time spent and you're looking at your calendar and, um, and granted I'm very structured. So, you know, every half an hour block for me every day is pretty much scheduled out. Um, which is for me happens to be an effective way to work. Maybe I'm overscheduled. It's super possible, but um, and then my goal in those conversations is to figure out where I can make a difference in that conversation, right? And and then the third is, you know, I'm looking for so I have great people. You know, I try to find areas where I can absolutely make substantial differences. And I think the other thing that that I that I wrestle with is I need to find things that also can be big, right? Really big, because you know I think the the greatest fear I think maybe of many entrepreneurs is that you're actually right, is that you have this thesis and you're building blockworks and you're right. And then suddenly your greatest fear will be that you dreamt too small. So if I told you that everything you wrote down on a piece of paper three weeks ago about the future of your business was going to come true, you'd probably look back at the piece of paper and been like, oh, I should have written so much fucking more then. You know what I mean? Right. And so, and so I I try to take this position of like, okay, you know, and it's hard because, because we all have our own constraints around how we dream about things and how we build things. But you know, the real, the real gift is to, to believe that you're going to be successful in where you spend your time, you know, weed out things that aren't successful for you and, and, and find the things that you really want to spend your time on, of course, but also make sure that your vision's big because, you know, you only have so much time, right? And so you want to, you want to focus on those. So, so I, if, going back, it's like, inc- you know, trusting incredible people around me, finding ways that I can absolutely make a difference to those, to those people's, you know, job and career and, and vision, and then make sure that we're spending time on really, really big ideas that can, that, that, that can get, get us where we want to go. 
last question that I ask mm-hmm. everyone, and then you can uh, get one question. We can flip the interview and you can ask me something mm-hmm. is, um, you seem like an optimistic and positive guy who probably sleeps pretty well, but like, what is one big thing that you're struggling to think through or like one big challenge that you're trying to work through right now that might be keeping you up at night? Um, that's a good question. Um, but pro- it's probably that last point on, on the, 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 the prior question, which is like, are we, are we collectively as a firm, am I as an individual, you know, spending time on things that if we're successful can have a big enough impact on whatever we want to impact, whether that's a double bottom line impact, environmental impact, a financial return impact, however we want it to impact, is it, is it big enough, right? And challenging myself to go back to that piece of paper and, and making sure I myself am, you know, and pushing myself up. I think that's a, that's a pretty natural thing to think through. And I, and I think I've, I think I've struggled with that over time because that also is connected to belief. And so it's like you do a small thing and then you do a little bit of a bigger thing and you do a little bit of a bigger thing. So your belief kind of builds upon both successes and failures. Um, and so luckily maybe I've had some successes and I've had a lot of failures, but in aggregate, it's been a positive learning experience. So now the question is, am I, am I reaching high enough? Am I thinking high enough? And part of that also, I think to helpful is, is to surround yourself with people of different opinions, like getting a variety of people inside your circle that challenge you to think bigger and, and hopefully uh, give you a different a different viewpoint on things, which is for me has been pretty important. So you're saying we shouldn't surround ourselves with a bunch of just Bitcoin maximalists? Is that what you're well, I mean, me? it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. I feel like if, you know, part, part of me on Bitcoin wants to spend time with a currency historian, you know, really to understand yeah. currency, you know, and really understand the true, but yes, I mean, if we, we often we surround ourselves with people that are like us. So we think more like ourselves in a certain sense. I used to spend time with a physicist because I just always loved physics and I never really understood it. And I always came out of those discussions with new ideas that actually applied to myself in business, right? Oh. And so I, 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 and I, and I have not clearly effectively structured these into my days, but I'd love to find some individuals I can spend time with, or even classes I can take, you know, that in, that inform me on topics that I'm totally unfamiliar with to kind of broaden the way I think about things. Do you remember one of the physics takeaways? Oh, I mean, I, I, I always got really fascinated with gravity and I think ideas have gravity and people have gravity. I mean, even like you're talking about like Matic and that social movement. Like one thing I think a lot about is, um, and I, I feel like actually Google did this really effectively. Like there was a point at which I met so many people in the technology world that made money through AdSense. You know what I mean? Like everybody had a website up and everyone had AdSense on it and they were making like a 50 bucks, a hundred bucks a month or something. And at some point I was, and then I think at that same time I was talking to this physicist around gravity and I was like, gosh, it's kind of like gravity. Like there's now this whole community of people that are pulling, pulling positive movement into Google. You know what I mean? Because like they're part of the ecosystem. Facebook has that same thing too. Bitcoin has that same thing too, right? It's like, it has gravity around the concept. And then maybe you're like, well, maybe Matic has that same thing too. You have so many people in the orbit of Matic that want Matic to succeed except maybe they're all Twitter bots. You can you know, figure that out on your next interview. <laughs> like, I don't know, but like maybe that, maybe that gravity created around a concept actually creates momentum. It's, it's not, there's no magic to this. It's right. You, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're thoughtful and strategic, when you talk to people about other stuff, you see reflections of yourself, right? And, you, and, and how that applies to you on a day-by-day basis. So um, it's not that that was any kind of brilliant moment. It was just that like, I look for those, I look for those things to help me think differently and try to rise me out of that day-to-day calendar infused email infused day and try to see something bigger all right you want to flip the interview and sure well i mean me? yeah i mean you so you've talked to all these interesting people like what are you know three common traits that you've seen across people that you think not necessarily are financially successful but have excellence you know that they're excellent in where they spend their time it could be investing could be developing could be code writing could be whatever it is but like what are three traits of excellence across their personalities that you see i actually think there's one trait um mm-hmm. that is by far the most important trait for i'm you know for not only successful people but honestly i think happy people as well mm. um, it's the number one trait i look for when hiring at blockworks It's the Mm -hmm. number one trait I look for when investing Um, and honestly just in in friends as well. And it's natural curiosity, Mm. just having a deep desire to fall down Wikipedia rabbit holes. And when you hear something that you don't understand to pull up Google and I'm always baffled by people, honestly, uh, who don't have, who, who aren't curious, 
I'm, it mm-hmm. like almost frustrates me on a personal yeah. level when they hear something mm-hmm. and they're like, yep, oh, must be the way the world works. Not, not going to look into that one. No, no questions yeah. there. All right, moving on. And I just, I don't actually personally understand it, but just from interviews with so many people like yourself and with phenomenal founders and, and investors and, and developers and company builders and operators, it's, it's just this innate curiosity to figure shit out that honestly, mm-hmm. usually they're not actually working on, right? To, to be an investor and to be innately curious about gravity is just like a phenomenal skill that um, mm-hmm. I think not only helps people build cool stuff, but actually makes their lives better because it's more fun yeah. to live like that. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really true. It's funny. Last night I had dinner with a friend that came to town and he worked for the CEO that I had advised for years and, and invest heavily in. And that CEO has this really interesting skill set where when you meet with that CEO over the period of an hour, at the end of that meeting, when that CEO leaves your office, you'll think to yourself, I have no idea what they do. And yet I told them all of my secrets, right? And the way he said it to me is like, oh yeah, that guy's like a CIA interrogator. He's like, when they walk in the room, that guy is there to just be so curious and get all your little, you know, secret points of information and to advantage himself and his business. And I've seen that with two or three of the best CEOs I've ever worked with, where they are just curious and they are, they're relentless about driving into that knowledge. So I totally agree with you. Like I've seen that over and over again. And I really respect that, respect that quality. Mike, this has been, I have loved this interview. This has been honestly just very thought provoking for me. I took some notes over here. Um, nice. I need to actually look up after this. So uh, <laughs> if there are entrepreneurs, um, if there are builders, best way for them to reach out to you guys, what, uh, just science.com? Yeah, you can go to science. Kind of the website science-inc.com. And uh, yeah, I mean, I see pretty much every contact form. So you're welcome to like, just drop us an email. I'm also super easy to reach on Twitter, et cetera. Like, I mean, I'm an easy guy to find, so. Amazing. Mike, this is awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, my friend. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Take it easy. 